Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and it is uh, 30-some degrees with the humidity here tonight. 91% uh, humidity, it said. And we just got another inch and a half of rain. So, yay, I guess. Um, I wish I could share because there's a lot of you that would love it. Okay, great to see so many of you already in the comments. Um, hello to John. Thank you for joining us again. I'd love to hear about the vacay. And we've got some really, really cool questions already queued up for tonight. So this is going to be a very interesting one. And I will tell you, well, I will say I know a lot about canola. There's very little I know about winter canola. So I hope to learn right alongside everybody tonight. So before we get going, a reminder that if you do collect CEU credits, you can head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow morning. Let us know you watch the episode and uh, get those collected and we do have a shout out for our show sponsors tonight's episode is brought to you by adama canada real egg radio and the canola school so while other sources of innovation run dry adama is here to deliver leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges we're all in on you talk to your adama sales rep today all right so hello to kevin to viren uh apparently i make for great background noise thanks viren that's really sweet of you um and <laughs> jason's here ray to uh pete who knows if it's my internet so maybe it is sorry about your luck okay uh let's bring in then our guests for tonight's discussion on winter canola we're going to talk a bit of spring canola as well uh but Without further ado, we bring in Jen Dolman from Megan Moran with Omafra, uh, joining us from Southern Ontario. Megan, welcome here. Hello, Jen. Hello. Hi. So, producer Jay, let me know if I'm freezing like crazy. I'll try not to move too much. Um, maybe I'll hand it over to, to the two of you. Okay. So, Megan, let's start with around where you're at and what the crop like where you are yeah your audio is cutting out a little bit but uh yeah we're we're uh i think i've seen some spring canola harvested some of the early fields um even in some of our northern regions a bit of canola is uh, starting to come off winter canola uh, long harvested uh hopefully uh, most of it will come off in July. Um, we, we'd like to see it harvested before winter wheat, but that doesn't always happen. Um, but uh, yeah, bit uh, strong crops this year, especially in Northern Ontario. Some of the best canola I've ever seen in my six or seven long years as canola specialist. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's been a good year for spring canola. Winter canola, we had some challenges, which we could talk about. Uh, we will. Absolutely. <laughs> now, has um, Jen, you have shared tonight, we're going to get to some images of uh, maybe some hardships on the winter canola front. Uh, but how how are all the other crops looking up Brim Freeway? I can't complain. And I think your audio actually cut out, Lindsay, just as you were introducing me. So in case people didn't catch it, I'm uh, one of Lindsay's neighbors in the Ottawa Valley. I'm just a little further up towards Algonquin Park. Um, so I think by standards, we're actually having a wet year. Um, there was only drought for about six weeks, so we really can't complain. And like you said, Lindsay, more rain again today. We haven't had the severe amounts you've had, um, but the crops are looking good. And compared to a lot of our friends in other parts of the world, we're pretty lucky. I think people are tired of doing hay, though. Yes. And also trying to make straw when it just keeps getting rained on. So it's very well washed, like both sides. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah, anyway. Okay, so hopefully my audio will improve or uh, we'll see. Well, you know what? At, at some point, Jay can just take over. Producer Jay can just take over. He'll ask very intelligent questions and everything will be fine. Okay. All right. So I do want to open it up um, to our comment section. Of course, we've got our great experts here. Get those questions in um, early for sure uh, so that we can get through them all. But let's set the scene here. Let's talk. Um, let's start with the basics. Megan, I'll start with you. I mean, canola is not a huge acreage crop in Ontario, but 
I would say maybe this is just, you know, anecdotal that there's growing interest in this crop. So where are we sort of at acreage wise and interest wise in uh, with winter canola or canola in general? Yeah, so it's it's fun when we talk to Western Canadian people about canola here in Ontario, because, yeah, we have like uh, our highest acreage in a long time right now at forty five thousand acres combined winter and spring canola so that's uh like a, a crop insurance number so that, that captures most growers though um so winter canola definitely growing interest and it our uh sort of um some of our research and and things we did uh with egg canada and and some of the stuff that i've done coincided with strong canola prices which was really lucky um and that helps the interest for sure uh so you know a few years we started out with there was a guy growing winter canola in the woodstock area and ha and there was a few hundred acres um more you know recently in the past it had been grown and and there were some failures and people kind of walked away from winter canola. But um, after we learned from this one grower and, and got our hands on some better genetics and tested them out, we saw about 1500 acres and then 5000 acres and then 10,000. And now what I hear is there's about 14,000 acres set to go in the ground now ish. So uh, definitely increasing interest. And I think in the past, we were growing it kind of out in Huron County. Uh, I wasn't a canola specialist in the 80s or 90s, um, but we uh, now are seeing it kind of throughout spring canola growing regions and down in the southernmost points of the province. We have it on Pelee Island. So um, okay. just, yeah, learning a lot about the crop and I see lots of potential. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So Jen, and we do have uh, Peter, of course, I can't wait his turn and has already asked questions. Um, so just kidding, Pete. I appreciate it very much. But Jen, as a, as an agronomist, but also a producer that grows both winter and spring, mm -hmm. set it up for us on sort of what your experience has been in, in working this crop into rotation. So we planted it three times. Once, like Megan said, ages ago, we got some genetics from Huron County um, and it was a it was a bust. Um, we tried Mercedes uh, in 2020 and we did everything wrong, like everything. We no-tailed it. Uh, we didn't put uh, nitrogen with it. Mostly it was a hold my beer and watch this moment. Um, and it, it was an epic disaster. Um, this year, and, and I, I'm a no-tiller, so it's like I hate like, doing tillage, like, especially because you know there's going to be like a big thunderstorm and you're going to get like erosion, but I like slugs are definitely the issue. Um, so spring canola, you're watching flea beetle. You're trying to get that up and growing fast so that you don't get eaten out of house and home by the, by the flea beetles. And in the fall, it's a race against the slugs and the volunteer wheat. Um, we both times intentionally, well, this year we're planning on it. Um, it's always, we're chasing our tail because like the spring wheat, we're still waiting on straw. Thank you for bringing that up. So once the mm -hmm. straw is off, we will plant the winter, the winter canola. Um, so we're kind of not going as fast as we would like. And we thought we'd be combining it before the winter wheat this year. And no, now we probably should have, but we were just too busy on wheat. And it was 8% when we shipped, so it worked. But I'm sure there's a, I'm sure we would have had better yield if we actually got to it on time. Right. Okay. So so many things there and so we'll start with peter's question megan sure. is it what is the ideal timing is it too early to be putting in winter canola right now was two weeks ago too early is two weeks from now too late what is our ideal timing so of course the it depends on where you're located um and uh and importantly there's a genetic factor so it's really variety dependent now the thing is we only have one variety so it really narrows down uh what's happening but winter or sorry the variety mercedes that's available in ontario is uh like globally one of the most winter hardy varieties um and also i've heard from people all in all different regions that it is not inclined to bolt in the fall and that's the important thing. We don't want to go into reproductive stages in the fall, and that's why we er worry about planting it early. Um, but n 
I have never seen Mercedes Bolt. I've seen it planted August 22nd in Gray County, um, or maybe that was North Wellington. Um, but it has, it, I have never seen it bolt and, and people have asked in other jurisdictions say, no, you shouldn't worry about it. So what we want is uh, big plants and big roots and that will help us survive the winter, which is our biggest hurdle. So we, I think we should be planting as early as we can uh, kind of in that last week of August, especially if you're like uh, north of Guelph, um, which we can talk about Western Canada that's a whole yeah. separate <laughs> degree of north, but because <laughs> um, yeah. I know we've made some Westerners curious, but um, yeah. the only legitimate planting date trials we've done were in Essex County, the southernmost parts of this province. And we can plant it kind of into like the 15th of September, but I don't necessarily recommend that. I think we should be planting it September 1st or earlier the heavier your soils and the faster winter comes where you live. So, okay. Winter wheat, we know it, it's not going to go to head until it vernalizes. Right. But, right. So, but winter canola. So two things. We, we certainly don't want it to bolt and, and start that reproductive stage before winter. Um, so obviously that's possible without any sort of vernalization. Is that what we're saying? But secondly, explain to me why it's so different as far as growing point in these sorts of things, as far as protecting it over the winter. Yeah. So great questions. Um, this is why the variety is important because I think there is a true, like, uh, there could be some true vernalization requirement in canola, but I'm, I'm not sure. What I do know is that there are some spring winter crosses that we plant that in some jurisdictions they plant in the fall. And when we plant them here and we plant them early, they bolt. Um, mm -hmm. So we don't really like the spring winter crosses and we don't recommend them. Um, but uh, basically winter wheat survives on the seed through the winter. So I'm not the wheat expert, but I hear that if it germinates, it doesn't even need to emerge. It can survive through the winter. That is not the case with canola. Uh, we need it to a big root that it can survive on the root. Um, so that's kind of the important part. And then um, what else? Vernalization? No. Um, yeah, we just want to, we want to, we don't want it to bolt and we want to um, have a big rosette, like, and big roots to survive. Sorry, I think I missed part of the question. No, nope. nope, oh, that's growing points. Yes, growing points. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. We we do want, there are some things you can do to improve winter survival. And that's like giving the plants, plants space to grow so they don't compete with one another. So we have like a picture of, uh, I have like uh, plants that are bunched close together. And if Jason wanted to put that up at some point and plants that are nicely spaced out and that when they don't compete with each other, the growing points kind of sit nice and close to the soil surface and they are more protected through the winter. Okay. Hang on. Wait, <laughs> we're, we're going to come back. We're going to come back to slugs. We're getting there, Jay. It's the rose. Uh, one more. I think there's like an X and a check mark on the picture yep. as well. One more. <laughs> and, oh, no. and we'll get there. We're like, maybe we're showing our, maybe not. We're showing our hand. No. Maybe it's before that. Well, here there we go. go. Ta-da. Yeah. So two, so sometimes we think, okay, I'm just going to put a lot of seed down and then hopefully half of it will survive and I'll have enough for a crop. That is the wrong thing to do. We actually want lower right. seeding rates with winter canola than we do with spring canola because when spring canola kind of goosenecks out of the ground, like in the picture on the left, it's not a problem. But that does leave our growing points a little exposed to winter kill. So bigger, more robust plants that are tucked close to the soil surface are best. Uh, okay. So, All right, Jen. Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to ask, did you do this or was this another thing yes. you did wrong? I no, no, that. no. And that was that's <laughs> kind of the thing, right? So it's the equipment is a big part of it. Because, you know, I'm the agronomist, so I'm always like giving the guys instructions, but I never get to run the equipment. So for me, I'm like, you need to seed this at 3.5 pounds per acre. And then like the first year, they're like, yeah, we can only get it down to six. 
like, but guys, it's not okay. Oh, right. And it's like a bag does 10 acres and the drill is usually doing soybeans and wheat and, you know, like tons yeah. and tons, not like a pickup truck is your crop. Um, yeah. So we're working on that in our communication. So I've been working. Uh, so we got it. Yeah, we got it down because that's a problem in spring canola too, right? So yeah. we've got it down typically often to like a four pounds, but I know, I know that's our limitation. And those Megan right. has some other pictures there that really show that heaving. I'm on tight white red fruit clay, like the worst thing to put canola onto, but if, if it does live, it's phenomenal for soil structure, right? Like you can't go wrong. So for me, it's still worth trying, but yeah, the left, that's what I'm specializing in. And then, <laughs> <laughs> when the slugs take them out in a nice manner, then you get everything <laughs> right. you wanted. <laughs> right. So we're going to try the corn planter this year. So we have better nice. singulation. Okay. So, so now, and, and quickly then, are you, do you, do you have like a specific disc for the planter? A canola then? plates. Yeah. yeah so it's a white corn that? planter. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And uh, we've been like, that's the thing we've been trying for ages, but our problem is in springtime, the corn planter is always busy planting corn. So, you know, you practice and you have a theory and then there's too much yelling and screaming and I love you and everything. And then it just never happens. So the other thing is, is that, and I see uh, Dr. Hooker put something about phosphorus trials. The other thing is I kind of want to see, we have like an inter planter. So it does 15 inch rows, but you only have fertilizer on every second. So, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of picking Megan's brain. It's like, should I do like plant the field twice or should I just, you know, try it? Cause phosphorus I know is so important for winter survival in wheat and, and canola disrupts the mycorrhiza function, but my, the ground it's going into this year is actually fairly high in phos. So I think we're just going to see what the weather's like and just go for it. I go for it. Okay. Pete also makes a point and I want it in Jen's defense. So Jen is saying pounds per acre and Pete says, well, what about varying seed size? Okay, so, but, and I don't know if the Mercedes comes like this, the canola companies have been doing, one particular company has been, it is 10 acres per bag. So they account for mm -hmm. the seed size. So yes, seed size varies, um, but we're working that into it. That And seed size can vary significantly. So it is on the bag. It will tell you, you do have to adjust for it. You're absolutely right, Pete. Um, but as Jen said, it's if it's one bag per 10 acres, they've done that math for you. Okay. Um, and so go ahead. Well, I want to just to follow up with this because we're talking number of plants. Megan, what is, do we have a either plants per foot of row or plants per meter square or foot or square foot? Do we have a target? There's a poll yeah. up on real agriculture right now about confusing units of measurement. I want everyone to go there and answer anyway. But yeah, what is our target plant stand? Let's start there. Yeah, it's it's uh, on the low side of what we would want for spring canola. So I say five to seven plants per square foot. Uh, someone else can tell me how many seeds that is per foot of row, depending on your row width. But um, we, I would say we max out at, mm, definitely max out at 350,000 seeds per acre. And I've seen like 250,000 seeds per acre. Uh, goes very well. So, um, okay. yeah, those are kind of the numbers. Um, if, and then checking uh, health in the spring and counting plants then is a whole other ball game. Uh, maybe some other numbers we could toss out there, which we can talk about later. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and of course, I mean, growers always ask me about pounds per acre, right? And there are growers using a grain drill, and that's, you know, how exact can you be? Yeah. <laughs> and they just try to ratchet it down as low as they can. And then they're, you know, with a planter, we're usually hearing around three pounds of seed to the acre. But again, of course, uh, yeah, somewhere in the 220 to 340, 350,000 seeds per acre. Okay. Well, and when, when it comes to seeding rates, like it's great to do the math. And, and I give the guys the math if the seed size is provided on the tag, which it's hit and miss on. Um, okay. but it's another thing for them to actually be able to get it low enough. Like we're right. almost to the point yeah. now where like, do we blend it with math? And again, that's why I think we need to be looking just with the excitement, like just the state of our drill, I guess, is maybe part of it. But, uh, but that's the one thing is, is like the theory and then the practical sometimes don't mesh. 
<laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Then, okay, so we've got some follow-ups, but I think we've answered this, John, of target plant population. So five to seven plants per square foot. And so that is, a, even with seeding rate, it is a range of seeds per acre. Um, and, and so that's good. Now we do have a few, and I was hoping that we would, we have a few Westerners on tonight's show, which um, thank you, Jason, for being here. And I know there's a few others that are here as well, uh, because this is, of course, the question that the West every once in a while also thinks about, could we start, you know, winter canola? Could we take advantage of some of the same um, things that a winter or a fall seeded crop gives us? Um, but Jen, I, I mean, I think you are, and you are growing winter and spring canola, but mm -hmm. that you are probably on the cusp of where winter canola really is going to work out, we think. Yeah. So Megan, yeah, so Megan, Let's talk about that sort of northern boundary or why winter canola makes more sense in the south. And as we go north, it starts to make less sense. Yeah, I mean, there, Jen kind of touched on it earlier, too, in terms of winter survival. It's not necessarily where she lives geographically. It is a harsher, earlier winter there, I, I assume. I haven't spent the winter there. Um, so that's part of the survival piece. And more, it's, we say winter survival, but it's like the spring, like how awful and backwards is the spring. Um, but the other piece is the soils at Gen Farms are uh, not exactly the place I would recommend we try winter canola. Um, heavy soils, uh, you know, the plants are slow to grow in the fall, which kind of sets you back. And we just have more moisture there and plants just kind of rot away through the spring. So I've seen um, Growers have strong yields on clay soils, but it was very touch and go. Uh, a lot of plants died <laughs> and it was very difficult to make a decision in the spring as to whether it was worth keeping or not. And there were big blank areas in the field where water had been standing. I mean, they had a good yield on the field per like total on that field, but it was it was a it was tough to manage. So, yeah, um, sounds, I like, had a, sounds like winter wheat, though. So, yeah, totally. Never plant yeah. winter canola where you wouldn't have a good success with winter wheat. And uh, we need at least like, I think, I think it's 450 growing degree days you want for wheat in the fall. I could be wrong. I'm sure Peter will correct me. But it's like at least 600 growing degree days in the fall uh, for canola, at least. Bigger plants are better. Um, so in terms of geography, yeah, field choice is, is number one. Um, if you have a field that like your wheat kind of dries out and, and looks crappy at towards uh, harvest, that might be where you plant your canola. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really recommend winter canola north of like Barrie, Ontario, which is nowhere near <laughs> our Canada US border in the West. No. Um, and that's simply because of yeah, not enough time in the fall for good growth, maybe, and just really slow spring. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, cold and wet in the spring, maybe, or, or just like, it'll start, it'll flower much later. And then you're, you might as well just plant it spring canola. <laughs> wow, <laughs> right. Jen, go ahead. Well, I think, again, we're still learning on this winter canola. And maybe last year was a fluke, and I'll never get lucky again. It was a really open fall, right? For mm -hmm. us, like we didn't really have a killing frost until November. Um, so it, just because it lived once doesn't mean it'll do it again. But I know with winter right. wheat, for us, a lot of it simply comes down to snow cover, right? Is that it's the micro environment that that plant is growing in. My husband's from Bruce County, and so they have six feet of snow and then green lawn and six feet of snow. Like for us, we, I kind of joke that we're Western Canada of Eastern, like of, of Ontario, even though we're on the other side is when we get snow, it stays. We can actually have a snowmobile season. Um, yes. You know, it comes and then it stays. So we're not having that same typical reaction. Like for us, we'll get minus 50 for a week in the winter time. Um, Northern Ontario obviously has way worse than that. But in, in Western Canada, we won't even get started. But in, in I think in that case, um, Winchester, for example, has a much more mild winter. Like you get closer to where you live, Lindsay. But like yeah. it's just ice city. Like it's just flat and, and wet. So like, you get freezing rain and that's it. So I, I think sometimes yeah. you need to look at that microclimate you're in too and how conducive that is. 
I'm lucky, Jen. I'm I'm sort of halfway in between Winchester and you. So we get the best yeah. of or worst of both worlds. <laughs> Depends how you look at it. Um, exactly. But yes. Yeah, but a really good point about what kind of winter. And Megan, as you pointed out, it's not really just your winter. It's fall conditions. And really, it's about spring. It's about that recovery. So, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to switch gears a little bit because we've got some really great comments, questions coming in. Um, some comments about um, exactly as you're thinking, Jen, mixing it in with fertilizer to try and get some cons consistency. And Mr. Sean Schill hops in here and says, uh, 180 to 200,000 seeds in 15 inch rows makes big roots so that yeah. worked out to about 2.2 pounds per acre in 2021 um, and will fill the space and this is one of those things absolutely the canola plant is amazing at compensating for space we know this uh from western canada as well it will branch like soybeans will do but even i mean those things are massive if you give them space so yes it is pretty amazing what they can do okay i do we're gonna we're gonna uh, go to the clip here. Uh, this is on, it's just a short clip on residue because I do want to talk about what, you know, we mentioned field selection, yes, um, but also people want to know about residue, about residue management, those sorts of things. So Jay, if we can go to that uh, Canola School clip and then we'll dig into some of these other questions on establishment and then the spring. <laughs> So Megan, what are the keys to crop establishment in the fall? What do you want to see, you know, fertility, nitrogen, how does it all come together? Yeah, I think one of the keys is we do need to do some tillage, especially where we're following winter wheat. Uh, residue really leads to big problems with slugs and slugs are really plentiful in the fall. So uh, some tillage for seedbed prep. Um, and we're putting, we need to get to about the six leaf stage. So we need about 30 to 40 pounds of nitro, actual nitrogen there and a bit of sulfur as well. So uh, we are putting up to, we don't have the, it all entirely worked out, but about 10 to 20 pounds of sulfur in the fall yeah. as well. What does this crop need to look like as you go in, in the fall, as you go into dormancy, Megan? What do you want to see in fields? Yeah, ideally I'd like the, we, we want to be in the rosette stage. Uh, we don't want it to bolt, but I'm less and less worried about bolting. I've never seen this variety really bolt, uh, this variety Mercedes bolt in the fall. So I'm really comfortable with planting early and getting it to the six leaf stage uh, is ideal. In the southern counties, if it's a little smaller, it'll probably survive, but um, I, I'm still aiming for at least six leaves. And yeah, we want a root. Uh, it's really about root growth. We want a nice big root, um, at least the width of a pencil, ideally. Mm. The bigger the root, the better the survival. What about um, winter kill? Is that an issue here in Ontario? Yeah, for sure. Winter kill is the biggest risk with this crop. Um, so that's why it's really important to, to get the crop planted early and, and try to get uh, good, robust plants heading into the winter. So like I said, we want them kind of spaced out so they have room to get nice and big. Um, the bigger the root, the better. It also prevents it from heaving. And we've had really good success uh, in some trials and based on info from colleagues in the States, Mercedes is really winter hardy. Um, so this variety does well and we have, you know, had to terminate some fields, clay soils are problematic, but uh, we're having pretty good success with overwintering. So I want right, to say so <laughs> six leaves. Glad, I, I've seen plants up to 12 leaves in the fall in this variety and it didn't volt, bolt and I'm really yeah. happy with what I see there and the more I am in the field the more I'm inclined to say eight or ten leaves in the fall is mm. is good. Okay I like this that was only from last year Megan and we're already updating. Okay very <laughs> Jen I, I will go to you in just a second I do want to send a quick shout out to our show sponsors to Adama Canada to Real Ag Radio and to the Canola School. So that was an episode of the Canola School from last year. Uh, we have, I think, 13 episodes up at Canola School, or 13 seasons, sorry, at canolaschool.com. Uh, and special thanks to our Canola School sponsor, Invigor Hybrid Canola by BASF. All right. So, Jen, go ahead. And then I have a little question. Yeah, it, it, mine's a question for Megan. So you're talking about them getting really big, right? So. In, and I think maybe we'll pull up the clip if you're okay with that of, remember I was saying it was the disaster, like that line between mm -hmm, what made it mm -hmm. and didn't. Like it's really, like with winter wheat, it's no big deal because you, you dig down, you kind of have the old leaves, you move to the side and you just look for that growing point. So this is, that's my wonderful husband off to the left there. 
So this is actually the good part of the field. And you can see even with tillage, there's a lot of straw there, right? Because we don't really do tillage all that well. That's why we're no-till. But if you go to the next uh, picture. Ouch. My, there we go. Okay. So right. and you can also see my terrible soil structure here. But it's like you see all those old plants. And it's like, like honestly, I just told my husband, because he's got a heart condition, don't drive by the field for a while uh, in the springtime. <laughs> Because I said, oh I'll just deal with it later. We're going to focus on the things we can control. But just when it's really big like that, um, so obviously when you could see that line, that's where the heaving was and where there was more slug, like the slugs took most of that out. But when there is carryover of that tissue, Megan, does it look like a big yucky rotting cabbage in the springtime? Or does most of that go away? Because from my experience, it's there. And, you know, and you kind of just want to tell the neighbors not to drive by. <laughs> 100%. This is a great point. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so is a yucky rotting cabbage okay? Uh, yes, yes. It depends. Okay. So basically, you just want to have a green growing point, and then the plant is alive. Okay. Um, and you do have to kind of check that the roots aren't totally mushy at the bottom, which I've only really seen on clay soils. Um, and you you do want to cut a few plants open to make sure they're not necrotic and hollow inside but uh if the growing point is green even if there's no leaves left um it it could still be a very healthy plant and and have strong yields if you are driving by in the field is looks all brown or looks all purple you might still have an excellent crop um yeah. it, the Wow. One year, I had a lot of growers say, oh, so-and-so's field looks terrible this year, eh? And it was like March, so it's it's still very early to say. And I went to that field, and yeah, from the road, it was deep purple, but the growing points were green, and, that, and they placed in the top three in the yield challenge. So um, we don't scout from the truck. Um, I do have a picture of how it, one crop progressed uh, through a season. This was quite a few years ago, early on in kind of our experience. Um, and it was, I met the grower in the field that day in March and everything was brown and kind of dead looking. And I was kind of panicky. Yeah, <laughs> I was kind of panicky because I didn't have a lot of experience with it that, at that time. And I'm not sure what to say to him, um, but that was a 75 bushel crop. So you just okay, have to wait. Like, that's hideous. <laughs> On yeah, yeah. And that the looks like stronger, it's awesome. Yeah, we talked about smell before this uh, mm -hmm. estimate started. The stronger the yeah. smell, the more scared you probably need to be. But right, right. <laughs> okay, true. so okay, yeah. <laughs> I I hope this is reassuring for some of you who have tried this are going. To, um, okay, but I I do so similar to like with winter wheat, either digging oh. up some plants or trying to find that, you know, healthy tissue in the middle. So we're cutting plants open. So this is good. So don't go by appearances, important. Um, and don't necessarily go by smell, but too much smell, maybe. Okay. <laughs> like it. This is very objective. I mean, it's a sliding scale. Of... <laughs> anyway, yes, Jen, go ahead. There was one more then, and I can't remember which slide it was, but the other part of it is not only is it is it rotting, but when we get like a cold, dry spring, a lot of that heaving on the clay ground, a lot of that canola, it's literally like it's, it's hanging by a ledge. It's hanging by like that one little root. You know, it's like, is this got enough root in the ground? It's half out, half in. Are we going to make it through or not? Right. And, uh, and it's a little, I don't even know if it was my own picture there. I so I might be making Jay go crazy mine. here. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Jay. I think it was one of Megan's. Okay. So let's talk nutrients but i also do want to dig into the the slugs and the flea beetles a little bit more but let's talk nutrients so jen uh you had mentioned you've got some decent background fertility so trying to figure mm -hmm. out with your planter setup what you're going to do there um we did have one comment i'll have to find it uh that talked about blending it in with um a particular product that they got a better size more consistency so they could do it but megan we know that canola needs sulfur um, and sulfur is one of those ones that, you know, we've got to get it there somehow. With winter wheat, we just did that show last week and it was, you know, phosphorus to save the day with the seed in the fall. What's, 
what's the thing to remember with winter canola? What do we have to have there in the fall? Yeah, so if we start with sulfur, um, you know, this is the same species as spring canola. So I think that, you know, even though we haven't done a lot of this research here in Ontario yet, we have kind of a lack of capacity for for research. Um, we know that it takes almost 20 pounds to get to the through the vegetative stages, 20 pounds of actual sulfate to get through the vegetative stages. So this is why I typically recommend like 10, 15 pounds of sulfur in the fall and then apply another, you know, if it's a 70 bushel crop, another 10, 15 pounds in the spring for the rest of the season. Um, nitrogen, again, we haven't done nitrogen work. Uh, we've talked to people in other jurisdictions and got a general idea from them, but same thing. We know, like, you look at the canola encyclopedia, spring canola needs, I mean, I, I'm recommending up to 40 pounds of actual N in the fall. Um, some growers have got away with none and some of those growers have manure and sometimes we see uh, nitrogen deficiency symptoms. But um, so the inexact science, but tried, <laughs> um, uh, you know, general recommendation is about make sure you have about 40 units available in the fall uh, of nitrogen. And then, yeah, uh, in the spring, uh, so it's the same thing, three to three and a half pounds of nitrogen per bushel with spring canola. It's kind of the same thing here. I'm saying usually around 150 pounds of N in the spring. I've been known to say 120, which I feel like is low, but a lot of these growers are brand new to canola. The price of fertilizer is kind of crazy. Uh, we know that uh, canola can still yield strongly with, uh, you know, You'll still have good yields, but maybe if you did put more N on, you would get more yield out of it. But uh, yeah, 120, 150 in the spring. Jen, how does that line up with your plans? I just do everything Megan tells me to do. <laughs> oh, God. <gosh. laughs> But Jen has more experience than I do. <laughs> wait, wait. My, my husband does. <laughs> and we have, like, it's great. Like, there's really good comments from Sean Schill on this. So I definitely recommend him for your next guest on this, Lindsay. Um, in some ways, you we just started song? with the bar really low. <laughs> don't be silly. But also, well, I don't think Sean will ever, ever, ever agree. But I'm going to try. Um, okay. So Dave, Dr. Dave has a really great, great, point here or question. And I think it's somewhat hilarious because in Western Canada, one of the best stubble choices is, is you put winter wheat on canola stubble, but he's flipping it around saying, should we be putting winter canola on wheat stubble? So the complete sort of opposite. And Dave, the, one of the reasons why canola stubble makes such a nice home for winter wheat is that snow trapping and that little microclimate that that stubble makes. So are we on to something if we're, if we're, or do we have to till? So Jen, I'll start with you. Where have you put winter canola when it worked well? Both times it was after spring wheat. So all I can say <laughs> is that when you don't have, okay, so a lot of our income comes from straw sales. And when you've got straw sales, then that means that like right now, you know, you've raked that straw six times or the one person had a little baler and couldn't take up the 35 foot head. So you've got this big chaff pattern. That's our biggest issue is, is, is residue management. I really want to do no-till. I want to, I, I just find that our ground is better as no-till. But again, I tried it with no-till thinking, oh no, Megan just thinks she knows Southern Ontario. No, no, it, it all died. So I'm just doing what Megan <laughs> says now until I can fine tune it. <laughs> Oh, boy. Got it. Yeah. So, Megan, what do you think? Winter canola into weed stubble, good idea, bad idea? Yeah, I think in theory, it would be great if we could do that. And trapping snow, in theory, is, is a good thing. But in my experience, uh, one of the biggest problems with winter canola, period, is slugs. And what, you know, I don't know, they probably don't have slugs like we do in in Western Canada. Um, so it, it seems like a strange thing. And, you know, we don't, we, we see some slug damage in soybeans, but it's, it's kind of just here and there. It's not a big concern, but they love canola. 
and they can eat a lot of canola in a short time and they take it right when it comes out of the ground. So there's not even a lot there to eat. They just clip it off and move on to the next. Um, sure. So I do have some images of slug damage. And a lot of times when I walk fields, anywhere there's little bits of residue, like the one in the middle at the bottom, there's less canola there. And that field is like almost fully chilled. But <laughs> And you see the picture on the right, of course, that wow. field was devastated by slugs. And it happened like, like that, like so fast. Um, but yeah, so if we could manage slugs without managing residue, I'd say, sure, go no-till. But it's so uh, yeah. do we have because this question comes up um, with slugs eating winter wheat seed as well, those sorts of things. Do we have any options for control beyond residue management? Because slugs are in the mollusk family, I learned. That's They're right. Basically a homeless snail. Yes. And yes. And so they are not an insect. So you can't <laughs> use insecticides on them. So do we have any options beyond just making it not a nice home for them? Not really. Um, and there are some like molluscicides. I, I think that's a word. Um, but uh, it is now. They're like for gardens or maybe for uh, higher value yeah. crops on smaller acreages. Like we, they're granular products and we've spread them in some research trials to save those small plot trials. But uh, it's not really a, an option yeah. for the f field crop. Um, and yeah, basically residue management, it's a thing. Now, the other thing I, mu I should mention is, you know, and we've seen, there's research that shows, and I've seen dead ground beetles in winter canola fields mm -hmm. because yeah. slugs eat canola, take up insecticide and just like carry it around. And right. then the ground beetles that feed on them die. Now, should we use no insecticide? That's a great question. I don't know if that's enough to save the ground beetles. I don't know if there's enough ground beetles there in the first place to eat all those slugs. I have, I have really no idea, but. So, okay, Jen, go ahead. Uh, I, I'm just glad Megan brought up the ground beetle because I know we've had issues with slugs in our spring canola. And, and again, because of flea beetle, we can't afford not to plant canola that's not treated with insecticide. But I often have my canola following bean ground or wheat ground and so I only put insecticides in the canola whenever possible and fungicide only on everything else um just in the I don't usually have insect problems um I obviously I can't make recommendations on other people's farm but in theory I'm hoping to be promoting good ground beetle I'm always a big fan of beneficials because you don't have to pay them yeah right they do their <laughs> work for you while you're off doing other things so I, I like yeah. that, but again, uh, you saw what that field looked like. The slugs ate me out of house at home still, so. Okay, so now slugs, though, are, for the most part, a fall problem. Am I correct, yep. Megan? Okay. Yeah, usually the plants are big enough in the spring to tolerate. Right, to withstand it, because they're not clipping yeah. off that growing point, necessarily. Yeah. Now, but flea beetle, are flea beetles at all a risk in the fall because i certainly in western canada you will get flea beetles everywhere mm -hmm. in the fall but i mean the the plant is mature it's whatever it's fine so am i worried about flea beetles in the fall on winter canola yeah that's a great question i wish i had a super great answer um we do see flea beetles in our you know spring canola at the end of the season and we sometimes are concerned so they're still around but in august there's less hungry i suspect <laughs> and they're already in august moving to their overwintering sites is is more the point so um i have seen a couple bites out of uh the cotyledons of winter canola but i don't think they're a huge risk but then like as soon as we say that like flea beetle will come and eat everything and the other thing is most of the fields that I'm walking regularly that are winter canola are in areas where we have not had a history of canola. So maybe right. my perspective is kind of skewed. Or just wait, because they'll find you eventually. They'll find, yeah, I feel like they might yeah. find it. <laughs> yeah. So Jen, your experience, you've you've grown winter wheat, winter canola and spring canola. Your spring canola, how yeah. important is that is that protection against flea beetles even imperfect protection but still protection in the in the fall sorry you just my internet cut sorry out, in the fall you're in asking, the, right no in the spring like how important in is it in the spring yeah absolutely like i 
we can't afford to put canola in the ground without flea beetle protection. Just, uh, yeah, like we, we try to push it in in April and then it runs out of steam if you, and then if you put it in, really, you can never get it in in May. It's like April or like end of May because it rains for three weeks straight or the ground is just too cold or 